Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for gathering with us at this time. To our board of directors, our family members, friends, and to our brand new graduates, welcome to the DMPs of Color commencement celebration for the class of 2020. Can you feel the urgency in the air, the need for change, the pressure in your very being of how can I contribute to being part of the movement? As a class of 2020, you have persevered through some of the most unprecedented times when the world stood still. A tipping point, COVID-19, the continuous senseless killings of black people, the pervasive healthcare inequities and racial injustices, which seem to have come together into one unifying message, Black Lives Matter. Where society as we once knew it is no more, and we've all had to stop, reflect, and focus on things that truly matter most in our lives. The world is different now. Despite these crises, sometimes it's what's needed to focus on moral obligations and grasp hold of the opportunity to think anew and obligation to act anew. In the midst of all this chaos, you have all managed to persevere and obtain your doctorates. As you prepare to launch yourselves into our brand new world, if I can say that, I want to impart to you these three things. The first point, aim to inspire. Always tell your story. It's what people wanna hear anyway. And I have a quote that sums up this point by Mr. Rogers. Um, some of you know, he was a children's educational programming pioneer and creator of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Some of you might know him and some of you will get to know him through Google. And the quote goes, never underestimate the impact your mere existence can have on another human being. There is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person. My second point, aim to empower. Be led by your passion and your purpose. These are the keys that will open the locked doors that will most certainly come along your path. Focusing on the true meaning within yourself will help others believe in themselves, pursue their passion and fulfill their purpose. And my last point, Aim to transform. Be the one to set the table. Yes, we want seats at the table, as we often say, but it is time to expand our focus to be the ones to set the table. In academia, be the dean. In research, be the principal investigator. In clinical practice, be the chief of the department. Lead the C-suite write the policies, but most importantly, get your doctorate like you all have already done so today. You have been equipped with the foundational tools to create an impact in our world. You have earned your doctorate in nursing practice. You deserve to be where you are. The year 2020 has given you the charge for change. So let's go and let's be that change. I'll leave you with this final quote by Angela Davis, and it goes, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. It is an honor to be in your presence and celebrate your amazing accomplishments. Congratulations and go forth and be great doctors of nursing practice of color. And I realized I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Daniel McKamey. I am currently the president, CEO, and founder of DMPs of Color. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Ethlyn McQueen Gibson, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Sandra Davis, who is currently an associate professor and assistant dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion at the George Washington University School of Nursing. 
Her research interests are health disparities, health equity, social determinants of health, and health care simulation. Dr. Davis's doctoral work focused on race-related stress, quality of life, and risk factors for coronary heart disease in African-American men. Dr. Davis actually has co-published in the Journal of Nurse Practitioners, and she is also a member of the AACN Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Work Group. She started her career in podiatry and spent several years in private practice before transitioning into a career in nursing. She has been in academia for more than 20 years. She is board certified as an acute care nurse practitioner and is past president of the Nurse Practitioner Association of the District of Columbia. I now present to you our guest speaker, Dr. Sandra Davis. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Gibson. Graduating class of 2020, I am honored to celebrate your accomplishments and to join you in your milestone achievement, earning the degree of Doctor of Nursing Practice. First, I would like to thank the founder and president of DNPs of Color, Dr. Danielle McCammy, for this opportunity to stand before you today as your keynote speaker. In addition, I would like to acknowledge the DOC's Board of Directors for all the work you have done to establish this organization. I want to acknowledge the members of DNPs of Color for the guidance and the support that you have given to the class of 2020. And thank you to the family and friends who are here today. You have stood by our graduates throughout their journey. Graduates, of the class of 2020, just let me take a few moments to look at your faces, to see each of you and connect with you. While I want to say I know what you went through to get here, I can't say that. I cannot say that to you. On top of trying to finish your coursework and complete your DNP projects, you were on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, all while trying to keep yourself safe and worrying about the safety of your family, friends, and communities. Some of you are mourning the loss of family, friends, and coworkers, and I extend my deepest condolences. I know that in the midst of all that was happening, you wanted to try to celebrate just a little bit, but perhaps like me, the senseless and brutal death of George Floyd and the deaths of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and now Rayshard Brooks just made you tired and weary. I salute you class of 2020, where you turned your struggles, your hurt, your anger, your fear, into an unwavering determination to graduate and to be here today. And so graduates of the class of 2020, it is with that same resolve that I focus my message to you today within the context of what's happening within our country. Class of 2020, there are many reasons for advancing your career and earning your DNP degree. However, in the 20 year history of DNP degree conferral, there has never been a reason as clear and as compelling as the recent collision of America's two deadly pandemics, COVID-19 and racism. DNP class of 2020, you are different. Indeed, unlike any other DNP graduating class that has preceded you, the decisions that you are making today about your new career opportunities and about the roles that you will take on as doctorally prepared nurses are being shaped and molded and informed and influenced by this extraordinary moment in our nation's history. What we see happening right now, the race, racial injustice, the police brutality, the disproportionate burden of risk, infection, and death in our communities of color 
from COVID-19 is the direct result of centuries of unaddressed racism and inequality. Unaddressed systemic racism is, in my mind, the most important issue in the United States today. And it has been so since before the founding of our nation. Over the fat past four months, we have been shaken to our very core by the rumblings of America's original fault line, the inhumane treatment and brutality upon which this nation was founded has now been exposed in all of its repulsiveness for everyone worldwide to see. And now, once again, the deeply entrenched barriers of racism and power are revealed for all of us to confront. DNP graduates, I am calling on you to use the power of your positions as doctorally prepared nurses to dismantle systemic racism and achieve health equity for all groups of people. I know your DNP programs prepared you well to take on roles in clinical practice, education, scholarship, policy, administration, and executive leadership. However, I was reviewing the DNC Essentials for Doctoral Education, and there are two competencies that I could not find in the document. And these two competencies are going to be essential for practicing in this defining moment of our nation's history. First, an anti-racist framework is mandatory for practicing in positions of power. For the most part, racism is not discussed in our nursing programs. Racism is different from prejudice, bias, discrimination, or diversity, all those terms considered safe and comfortable to talk about in the classroom. In order to use our power, we have to be very clear about what racism is and how it operates within our organizations. Racism involves one group having the power to carry out systematic discrimination through institutional policies, practices, and by shaping beliefs and values that support those racist policies and practices. Anti-racism then is the active process of identifying and eliminating racist policies and practices. Anti-racism is a way of seeing and being in the world. I will give you a few examples of what it looks like in practice. Healthcare systems, diversity or HR statements often contain words that allude to valuing the success of all employees. But if you look at the wall of the photos of the C-suite executives, which are usually prominently displayed in a facility's entrance, what do you see? Are they mostly white? Is there diversity among those who are making the decisions about employees and patients, making the decisions about your practice and making decisions about funding for communities they serve or creating innovative models of care for the communities they serve? As anti-racists, we speak up we start to hold organizations accountable for what they write. Moreover, an anti-racist framework will help us to identify and address power imbalances so that leadership is shared equitably. Right now in our healthcare organizations, 91% of CEOs are white, 95% of CFOs are white, and 92% of chief nursing officers are white. Let me give you another example. In clinical practice, we may hear students and providers referring to people of color as those people or saying things such as, you can tell them, but they're not going to do it anyway, or she comes from a bad neighborhood. How is this type of behavior going to be changed? not by one lecture on implicit bias or a yearly mandatory training on microaggressions. This change has to start at the curricular level in health professions schools. 85% of full-time nursing educators are white. 
We need more faculty of color who are at the table, at the national level, making the decisions about what is taught and why it is taught in our nursing programs. For example, when we talk about health disparities, the learning needs to be contextualized to understand both the historic and contemporary drivers of racism. Increasingly, over the past 30 years, there has been a greater focus on racial health disparities. However, if you think about it, there has never been a time in the history of the United States that racial health disparities did not exist. From the slave health deficit to medical and scientific exploitation to health system discrimination, the experience of racism and the resulting disparities can be traced back 401 years for Black people in America. And health disparities can be traced back 500 years for Native Americans. Racism continues to kill millions of Americans. Why isn't racism considered a modifiable risk factor for excess morbidity and mortality? Native American, Latinx, Black populations are dying at disproportionately higher rates from COVID-19 with a staggering divide in the COVID-19 mortality rate between Black Americans and the rest of the nation. At least 14,400 Black lives would have been saved if Black Americans died at the same rate as white Americans. Black dignity, Black bodies, Black lives matter. The second essential needed for practice is structural competency. A structural competency framework is mandatory for practicing in positions of power. For the past 25 to 30 years, the health professions had focused on cultural competency. Cultural competency in all its iterations, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, cultural humility, were conceptualized at a time when we were not even saying the word racism. It was developed before health professionals were willing to acknowledge racism as a structural determinant that is the root cause of disparities and a driver of the social determinants of health. Therefore, we need to move beyond cultural competency that focuses on individuals and individual interactions to structural competencies that focus on the broader social, political, and economic structures that influence health and health care. Through a structural competency lens, we learn to recognize how decisions made by systems at broader upstream levels perpetuate racism and lead to the inequities that we see downstream in the social determinants of health and the disparities that we see in health, health care delivery, and health outcomes. The ramifications of COVID-19 illustrate whilst why structural competency is so important. We've been hearing on the news that the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 experienced by Black people is due to their higher burden of chronic diseases. This is not the true story. You have to go one step farther, one step farther to find the truth. You have to ask the why. Why do Black people have a higher burden of chronic diseases? That's where you find your answer. That's where you find the truth. Adopting a structural competency framework for practice means that we need to move outside of our organizations and join boards of nursing, medicine, and public health, where we are making decisions on policies and practices that affect our practice and the health, safety, and quality of care of our patients. Structural competency demands that we join our professional organizations and that we have a voice at local, regional, and national levels, and that we're develop, developing policy, and that we're at advocating for change. It means having a voice in local politics. And so that puts us on school boards, on economic development task forces, in nonprofits, and 
on interprofessional health care coalitions. It moves us into grassroots community organizing in communities of color to analyze, create, and change policies and practices that affect the, pe the places where people live, work, play, age, and grow. Our communities of color need us now. There's racial trauma in our communities from the COVID-19 pandemic and racial injustice. Future research is going to focus on Latinx, Native American, Asian, and Black populations. We are needed, we must be, on interdisciplinary research teams. And as Dr. McCammy po pointed out in her opening address, we have to be the PI on these teams. And when we go into communities of color, we need to speak up and ensure that our teams are going in as equal community-based participatory research partners. Class of 2020, I have given you two essential additional competencies needed for practice. Now, I want to give you some advice. While I know that your presence and your hard work will positively impact your patients, colleagues, students, and will lend significant value to your organizations, I also know that institutions in which we work are microcosms of the largest systemic racism reflected in U.S. society. I have to acknowledge that some of the day-to-day -day experiences you have as DMPs of color may make you feel marginalized, invisible, or invalidated. Applying our two new competencies for practice will help you to realize that these experiences are not personal. Rather, they are the result of dominant worldviews of superiority versus inferiority, power versus oppression, and privilege versus disadvantage. However, knowing this does not negate the barriers to reaching the full potential of your career, nor does it nullify the psychological, emotional, and physical impact of these experiences. This is why I strongly support your organization, DNPs of Color. We need each other, and DNPs of Color, you are never alone. I am reminded of the African philosophy of Ubuntu. I am because we are. I am because we are. Your organization's collaboration, capacity building, and amplification are all so inspiring. Your organization also reminds me of the NCW's motto, lifting as we climb, because this organization recognizes the importance of preparing the way for the next generation. Class of 2020, in the past, time and time again, when faced with the imperative to end the enduring legacy of racism, we, as a nation have not been able to do it. Until now, we have been at the periphery, chipping away at strategies put into place to avoid the root cause of disparities and inequities. And not only healthcare, but every sector of our society. This time, with 26 days of nonstop protests all over the world, America is showing the will and the capacity to acknowledge that this nation was built from the very beginning on systems of power, privilege, and inequality. And that work must be done to dismantle systemic racism. Change is not going to happen overnight and is going to take each of us and all of us to engage for justice, dignity, and equality. Barack Obama said, I have always believed that hope is that stubborn thing inside of us that insists, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that something better awaits us, so long as we have the courage to keep reaching, to keep working, to keep fighting. There's a crack in the door right now, DNPs of color, that's leading to truth, healing, reconciliation, and transformation. 
Class of 2020, you have risen to the 1% of nurses in this country who hold doctoral degrees. Step into your power and be the force of change that this nation needs. Thank you. All righty, so we're on to um, the next portion of our ceremony. I'd like to introduce Dr. Tony Murray, who will be presenting our graduates. If your name is called and you feel so compelled to cheer, because that's what we do at graduations, please, it's an honor to celebrate with you. So let's celebrate together. All right, without further ado, Dr. Tony Murray. Good morning, and thank you for that very impactful uh, talk to us today, Dr. Davis. We take that charge, we accept that charge, and we will move forward. Thank you again. Good morning, graduates. I am pleased to announce our 2020 Doctors of Nursing Practice graduates uh, from programs across the country. It is a true honor. With further ado, Dr. LaTanya Bather, Chamberlain University, Improving Patient Readiness for Discharge with Project Red. Dr. Darlene C. Beck, University of Alabama, Implementing and Evaluating an Evidence-Based Intervention for Obesity in Primary Care. Dr. Akia Blandon, Chatham University, reducing 30-day all-cause readmissions in the post-acute care environment. Dr. Anelsa Blunt, South University, for education about the importance of and the use of a depression screening tool compared to no educational seminar, increase the number of patients who are screened for depression. Dr. Jakea LaShawn Brown, Grand Canyon University. The impact of physical activity on chronic low back pain. Dr. Anne Marie Buchanan Cummings, Medical University of South Carolina. Opioid overdose education and Narcan distribution at a substance use disorder treatment center. Dr. Tiffany Chatterme, the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Implementation of a fall prevention toolkit for older adult clients in the community clinic setting. Dr. Olivia Cox, University of Buffalo creating a self-help pamphlet presenting self-care and self-care resources for registered nurses working on a telemetry and a non-telemetry medical surgical unit in a hospital to help manage stress and promote work-life balance. Dr. Miriam Dobson, Grand Canyon University. The effect of the parent bonding questionnaire on referrals to support parenting. Dr. Victoria Donaldson, George Washington University, implementing a digital imaging platform using tissue analytics in a level one trauma center. Dr. Lakeisha Falls, University of Arkansas for, for medical science. Don't sugarcoat it. Implementing a diabetes flow sheet to increase adherence to ADA guidelines. Dr. Angela Yvonne Felton Coleman, John Hopkins University. Increasing medication adherence in HIV positive young adults a quality improvement project. Dr. Camilla Gibson McElroy, University of California, Los Angeles. Staying focused, 
provider utilization of an electronic health record diagnostic and statistical manual five criteria evaluation tool for individuals with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dr. Tanshanika Hellam, George Mason University. Save a life in 20 seconds. Increasing providers' awareness on cervical cancer using thermal ablation as an alternative screen and treatment method. Dr. Kina Jackson, Duke University. Group coaching among individuals with prediabetes in a face-based setting. Dr. Tanya Johnson Harvey, Valparaiso University, a provider-led intervention for obese and underweight African-American women with a BMI over 25 kilograms over meters squared over 12 weeks. Dr. Lynette N. Handy, University of Alabama, Huntsville. Identification of surgical patients at risk for opioid no, abuse using opioid risk tool in the pre-anesthesia testing center. Dr. Laura Love, Grand Valley State University. Self-monitoring of blood pressure in community dwelling senior adults. Dr. Melissa Morgan, Pace University, implementing a culturally adapted hypertension nutrition program for an African American population. Dr. Eileen No, Frontier Nursing University, implementation of screening and effective care for cancer prevention at Get Med Urgent Care. Dr. Charlotte Pace, University of Maryland. Secure messaging in a patient portal, improving efficiencies for patient provider communication. Dr. Terry Page, Virginia Commonwealth University. Navigating obstacles, clinical and ethical barriers and long acting reversible contraception for adolescents. Dr. Michelle Parr, Samford University, using simulations to enhance environmental cleaning practices in diverse healthcare settings. Dr. Nicole Renicki Powell, Youth Obesity, implementation of education process to reduce screen time and increase physical activity. Way to go, Nicole. Great job. Dr. Monica Sanchez, Kansas University, Beyond the Scope, Effects of the Clinical Practice Environment on Level of Autonomy in Nurse Practitioners. Dr. Kenya Smith, Regis University, evaluating a teaching session on how to use a new computer decision support system tool. Increasing knowledge, motivation. Dr. Malvis Indips Timon, the George Washington University. Screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment protocols in the emergency department. Dr. Kashmir L. Thomas, Florida State University. Adolescent Mental Health Literacy, be in the know. Dr. Keandra Lene Thompson, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Cognitive Behavior Therapy and Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Patients with Anxiety. Way to go, Dr. T. Dr. Tamika Michelle Whiten, 
University of South Alabama, the sweet spot, improving metabolic outcomes of type 2 diabetes. Dr. Jean Thorpe Williams, John Hopkins University, implementing a discharge teaching protocol to reduce 30-day readmission rates in adults diagnosed with sickle cell disease. We thank you. Congratulations, doctors. Yay, congratulations to all of you. Congratulations, Nicole. Proud of you. Congratulations. Congratulations, everyone. Awesome. So without further ado, we have some closing remarks by Dr. Dembola Akintade. Thanks to, uh, to, to everyone for, for being here. And once again, for our first um, DOC's virtual commencement. Um, it's really not about us, the board members, but uh, I believe it's, it's about the graduating um, students. So welcome to the profession. Um, I thank our, our commencement speaker for uh, your uplifting message. I'll you know, thank um, the board members for uh, putting this together. And I think just my, my important take home message is just to remind each and every one of us of our role. Um, this is the year of the nurse, and um, you're graduating at a very important time. So COVID-19 first threw us for a loop. It um, demonstrated that our best um, well-laid plans really have no place in the face of um, a global pandemic. And it's really taught us how to think outside the box. And along with that, we've also experienced um, institutionalized and just structural, you know, structural racism throughout not just the country, but the world. And I think that's also given us the opportunity to stop and take a very serious look um, at not just ourselves, but our role as nurses and as advocates. So as you graduate, um, one of the things I'd like to leave you with is to remember that as nurse leaders, you're, you're advocates, you're the voice of the future of nursing, uh, but also uh, we've, we've earned a seat at the table. Um, that's one of my biggest messages. And having a seat at the table in the past was good enough, but now that's no longer enough. So we need a seat at the table, and we need a voice while we're at the table. So please make your voices heard. Be advocates, um, but most importantly, be professionals. Congratulations once again. God bless. And um, we welcome you into the DOCs. And please, please, <laughs> thinking, start thinking of how we and uh, grow this wonderful um, uh, opportunity to be support systems to one another. So thank you and congratulations once again.